and get started a little bit earlier. I had sort of misspoke and gave you 10 more minutes than I was supposed to give you. Uh, and I think most everybody's coming back into the room. Uh, but feel free to get up. Feel free to get up and uh, get coffee or cookies or whatever you might want from the food table and the drinks. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Donald Royal. He is a professor of the Julia H. and Van Buren Parr Professorship, University of Texas Health Science Center here in San Antonio. Uh, we had the pleasure of having Dr. Royal come to uh, Houston to speak with us or, or to talk with us about executive function and capacity and uh, we were just had the most delightful conversation I think that we kept him much longer than he expected to be there because we asked so many questions and had such good discussions with him uh, he's uh, a director of the psychiatric program here and uh, operates a comprehensive interdisciplinary geriatric evaluation and management team uh, and also a uh, uh, for the South Texas Veterans uh, Health Center. Uh, Dr. Royale has an expanded research agenda and is involved in ser several multi-center phase three clinical trials for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. He has many, many publications. You will be introduced to the Cox test while you're here and tomorrow, for those who are staying, they will have, you will have practice with the clocks test. And uh, Dr. Royale was instrumental in developing that test. We use it with our assessments. We're so pleased that he's here and he does have a very, very busy schedule. So, Dr. Royale. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm uh, really happy to be here. Um, what, what you didn't mention all of, in all of that is that uh, I went to Texas A&M, so I'm an Aggie, and it, I think the, the Aggies taught me everything I need to know about dementia. <laughs> and, and the way that I've come to understand dementia isn't really directly related to the way I think most of the world understands dementia. And so uh, basically they, they included a talk in your uh, module there uh, from Baylor, but when I looked at it, uh, I realized that that wasn't really close to my uh, central message. So in, in kind of the bait and switch, I wasn't originally supposed to speak here. I'm gonna tell you what, what I think is important about dementia and particularly with regard to uh, uh, cases of potential self-neglect and abuse and uh, try to frame it around a clinical syndrome that I'm sure you're familiar with, even if you don't know the name already, and that's the Diogenes syndrome. So I, I think that the essential feature of dementia, what makes people demented in the first place, is not really memory loss, but is uh, what we've come to understand as executive functions. And I'll show you a convenient way to measure that through clock drawing uh, that will basically uh, very sensitively detect people with executive impairment but uh, what you have to realize is that relatively few of them will meet criteria for dementia because our dementia criteria are predicated on the symptoms of a particular disease, Alzheimer's disease. And so they're very good for detecting Alzheimer's disease as one particular cause of dementia, but they're very bad in detecting people with executive impairment. And so there are many more people out there who are demented on the basis of severe executive impairments than the subset who actually have Alzheimer's disease. There are many other situations that can cause executive impairment besides Alzheimer's. And if you use an Alzheimer's biased case definition, you'll be really good at finding the few who have Alzheimer's and really terrible at finding all the rest. 
And I think that's part of the frustration. Now, you can actually assess these people and come away with impressions like, well, her memory was really good, but why do they live like that? Right? It's because memory really doesn't create functional status. And so you can't use memory tests to screen for conditions that disable people. Instead, you need to learn about uh, executive function. Uh, so at the end of this module, I'm going to help you distinguish executive function from other cognitive functions, traditional ones like memory and language and that sort of thing, and show you how you can assess it through clock drawing and apply it to a particular common condition, the Diogenes syndrome, and uh, then help you identify executive impairments in other conditions that you're likely to find. And I want to show you that, that these are reversible. So unlike the dementia due to Alzheimer's, which is very difficult to reverse, some of the other causes of executive impairment may actually be treatable. And so one real strong reason to find them is that they don't have to be like that. Right? And if you use the wrong test, you won't find them. Um, now, I know that this module has pre and post uh, questions, and I think that basically at the end of this talk, you'll still get the answers uh, that you need. Except sometimes I even disagree with the pre and post questions. So, <laughs> so uh, which of the following is true concerning the U.S. aged population? Uh, you know, if I had to choose one of these answers, I would have said the fastest growing is those over the age of 60, but that's not really true. The fastest growing subset of the United States elderly population are people over the age of 85. Yeah, well, they're, but, but they're growing faster than just everybody over 60. And, um, but you have to realize that, that you know, it's 80-year-olds who are growing exponentially. And there are already more people over the age of 80 in the United States than are under the age of 20. And aging causes executive impairments. So there are very many normal 80-year-olds who nonetheless have executive function that would put them at risk for abuse and neglect, even though they are not diseased or demented, uh, according to traditional definitions. So I think that's an important point. OK, so uh, the Diogenes syndrome is a particular name of a condition that you'll recognize uh, by other names, maybe. Uh, senile squalor, older people living in filth, or hoarding, uh, abnormal hoarding. And it's been defined by five criteria. Uh, the house is a wreck. They're neglecting themselves. They're usually living alone, meaning that they don't have a social support network to look after them. Uh, they tend to be collecting things, it seems. Some things are completely useless, and some of them are like brand new things, but never taken out of the box, right? So they're not, they're not potentially useless, but they're, they're not being used. And uh, a key characteristic of this syndrome is that they're not really bothered by this and resist anybody's efforts to tell them that this shouldn't be done. And, you know, here's an example. Okay. Uh, so, you've seen this house before. If you make house calls, if you've been in people's homes, even though in clinic they might, as the, the previous speaker said, uh, be highly educated professional people in clinic taking their medicines, if you go home, it looks like this, right? Okay. So uh, the prevalence is, is unknown, but it's not rare, okay? Uh, these are easy to find once you start looking for them. Uh, they do not have true obsessions or compulsions. A lot of people try to understand this or explain it away as an obsession, that they're somehow obsessed with collecting. But I'm gonna show you that that's not really the case. About a third of them are psychotic. They have some other mental disorder. A third of them can be diagnosed with traditional definitions of dementia, but the last third, survive screening for just about anything you want to apply except maybe executive function. And so they were thought to be normal. And so the name of the Diogenes syndrome came to explain this last third. How can you explain all of these people, not uncommon, not hard to find, who are living in filth and yet their memory is normal, their many mental scores are normal, they're not depressed, they're not psychotic, they don't meet criteria for dementia. Do they choose to live like this? And uh, so Diogenes was a cynic philosopher who tried to get away from all the values of society. And he basically went around in a barrel, naked, because he felt like if he didn't want to wear clothes, why should society tell him he has to wear clothes? And he basically tried to uh, get around all of the assumptions of society. And so he began a movement of philosophy called cynicism, where they, they basically uh, trying to say that nobody, you know, a competent person has the right to live their life however they want and nobody can tell them what they need to be doing. Um, 
And so basically, um, uh, that's where the name Vidogeny syndrome came from. Uh, there are very few studies on this. Uh, this is probably just about the biggest one to date in 2000. They only, they, they looked at 81 people referred for home cleaning services. What they mean there is like total nuclear destruction. You know, they, they're, the moving van comes up and they, people are carting stuff out of the house for days to try to get rid of it. Um, and uh, they gave them a scale that looked at their, uh, how bad the situation is and um, they tried to diagnose mental disorders. They found that uh, basically uh, most of them were men, half were elderly, and uh, yet a small fraction were relatively young. 13% uh, uh, were under the age of 45. Uh, most of them had a diagnosable mental disorder of one kind or another, and a small fraction had physical handicaps and limitations. And the most common mental disorders were alcohol abuse, dementia, schizophrenia, uh, and a couple were mentally retarded. So you could get the sense of a grab bag of vulnerable people, mostly men, mostly living alone. Uh, but the elderly in this sample were less likely to have a mental disorder to explain why they would be living like this. And uh, that's where I get to the fact that the fastest growing age group are people over the age of 80, and these people have a high frequency of executive impairment, even if they're normal. So, um, so basically, uh, if you define the Diogeny syndrome by all five of the criteria that I told you about, not uh, many of them satisfied all five. So again, you get the sense that there's a core group who meet all of these criteria, and then there are some sort of pretender groups that are a grab bag of other conditions that orbit around this. They, they behave in a similar way, but they're not quite exactly the same condition. Now. Even though a lot of people see this as maybe hoarding, I mean, that would be the first thing that comes to your mind, is that these are collectors. Uh, collecting is actually a relatively highly organized function, whereas the sort of squalor we're talking about is very disorganized. And I think that betrays, people with executive impairment have plans, goals, and are able to organize their behavior towards those ends, even if the plans and goals are confused, misguided, uh, wrong, uh, they can still come up with the plan. Um, what I think happens with the Diogeny syndrome is something far less organized, far more confused, far less able to be justified. So uh, these hoarders, here's a guy who hoards. This guy has spent years of his life collecting string, right? And a lot of time, people who uh, uh, collect things uh, obsessively know that it's kind of silly know that it's a waste of time, energy, money, and expenses, wish really that they didn't have to do it, but they feel driven to do it. And that's a key feature of obsessive compulsive disorder, right, as a, as a mental disorder, is that it's what they call ego dystonic. People with OCD do not want to be doing what they're doing, and they suffer from it. The people with the Diogenes syndrome say, what, this a mess? Well, I'm going to have a garage sale next week. Right? They're not, they're not suffering. We're the ones. The neighbors are suffering. It's the people you know, walking through the cat feces when they try to visit them who are suffering. But the, the Diogenes patients themselves purport not to be suffering at all. And so that violates one of the major conditions for obsessive compulsive disorder. So I don't think that that's the proper way to think about this. Uh, there are some other examples of quirky, eccentric people who collect junk. Right? but in a kind of an organized way. This is, you can go visit this in Houston. Uh, this is the Orange Show. And this guy spent you know, 20 or 30 years of his life. A lot of the people who do this, for whatever reason, are uh, retired or ex-postmen. <laughs> so this guy was a postman who went all around the city on his rounds, and along the way, he'd find junk in a construction site, and he'd kind of say, you guys can use those bricks. Right? And they would say, well, no. And so he'd load them into the post truck and take them home with him and stay up at night doing this. But the, it's not just this guy. This happens all over the world in every culture that's been examined. And so here's an example of a postman from the 1800s in France who started doing exactly the same thing. And look what he built. This is a national monument in France now. Now, some of them turn out really cool looking like this. Most of them turn out to be something that's kind of an eyesore in the neighborhood. Uh, but there's every level of functional capacity from somebody who's just piling things up in a corner of his backyard 
and calls it something to somebody who completely redoes the entire landscape around them. Uh, this is another example in the United States. This is Watts Towers in Los Angeles. And uh, this is an uneducated, unemployed uh, guy who just went around collecting stuff, building this thing for whatever reason. And it's on the National uh, uh, Historic Landmarks uh, Registry now as, a, as an amazing feat of architecture. But he had no architectural training. This is just bottle caps and seashells and pieces of old rebar you know, put together. So on the one hand, you have eccentric people who probably do have some sort of mental disorder, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is just garbage, just living in filth, right? And so um, these are all real cases. Uh, so what, what is this? What, what's going on here? So in the Diogenes Syndrome, just look at the sort of array of stuff. I mean, you know, some of the stuff's still in the bags. It's still in the boxes. It's obviously not being used. It's not necessarily, you know, useless, most of it. Uh, but there's no collection. There's no theme. This isn't a guy getting on eBay in the middle of the night waiting, waiting for the right thing on plastic to be, you know, so I think that most of this is people who get things and then they can't get rid of them afterwards. Because think about it, getting rid, think about junk mail that comes to you every day, right? Uh, there's a certain amount of intellectual sorting that has to be done. And this sort of sorting is uh, the sort of task that uh, is incorporated into many executive measures. You have to decide what's obviously junk mail, what's possibly fraudulent, what's really important, what's uh, useless, what's tolerable, right? And you sort them into piles and then you throw it away every day. But what if you have trouble sorting and making decisions and planning and weighing the relative merits of things? Then one piece of junk mail is just like any other piece of junk mail and you can't really get rid of it because you might use it one day and that's just today's mail. But then there's tomorrow, the next day, the next day. How long would it take? For your house to start looking like this, right? And so I, I think they have a, a trouble with these sorts of intellectual operations that are related actually to executive function and diseases that affect the brain regions that are related to that, most notably the frontal lobes. So the hoarders have a gradual onset. Uh, they don't have any insight. They're usually alone because it wouldn't pile up if somebody came along and cleaned up after them, right? So they're usually alone. Um, they tend to be irritable and dysphoric, but they're not truly psychotic. They're not doing this because a voice told them that they are going to win the lottery. Uh, they're generally passive and apathetic about it, and they ex exert low amounts of effort to fix this. The, uh, that sort of passivity and indifference are signs of frontal lobe brain diseases. So the executive functions are cognitive functions that command and control more complex goal-directed activities. They, your, your complex behavior is built out of bits and pieces that are responsibility of other systems in the brain that don't really know what the plan is, right? So you have memory centers that go find the right memories to solve your problem. And you have language centers that find the right words to explain your situation. But the frontal lobes and the executive function know what the situation is and are trying to find out what memories do we own that can help us solve this problem. So you can lose the executive function independently of the memory and the language, and you'll find people who can't begin to put the behavior together even though they can remember everything that has to be done. You see, because putting things together is a different kind of cognitive skill than having the capacity to do each of the steps. And this was related to the definition of dementia only relatively recently, in 1994. And even now, it's considered a minor part of dementia case definition, most of which are biased by the fact that you have to have memory loss first or you're not even in the differential of dementia. The frontal lobes, though, is a big place. This is 30% of your brain's weight and surface area. So if your assessment ignores executive function, you're missing what 30% of the brain does, right? But on top of that, this is the last 30% to have evolved. And it's the last 30% to complete its normal maturational development. So the implications of this is that, number one, children haven't finished their frontal lobe development yet, so they don't have good executive function. And that explains a lot. Because <laughs> it starts to help you understand how in old age, a brain disease would destroy executive function and render your client childlike. They will remind you of children. Plus, children are a good model for understanding what it's like to live with executive impairment. You know, 
What can a child do for themselves? What can they not be uh, trusted to do for themselves? And the situations are very similar to what you'll see in clinical practice with mentally ill people and people with uh, frontal or brain diseases. So um, you know that children uh, have better vision than adults, right? They have better hearing. They have faster reaction times. They have better memory. They can learn any language you expose them to. They have better cardiovascular stamina. You have better joint mobility and flexibility. If any of those variables were important for functional status, children would rule the world. <laughs> right? But what it comes down to is children don't rule the world because they don't have any executive function. And it doesn't help them. All the strengths in those other domains do not help them rule the world because they need executive function to stay focused on their goals, to create the goals in the first place, to see the implications of their actions into the future. These are all executive functions that are lost in old age and in uh, certain brain diseases. And it re renders people, even people who still have good vision, hearing, arthritis, and that sort of thing, childlike, and so they can't get anything done. Uh, this is just comparing a monkey, a chimpanzee's frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is only 10% of a chimpanzee brain. It's 30% of a human brain. Most of the, brain, uh, the genes that distinguish chimpanzees from humans are genes that are related to brain development. So most of the evolutionary changes that have brought us past the level of chimpanzees are related to the creation of a new brain region, the frontal lobes, that other, or even our closest relative doesn't have. And the intellectual capacity of chimpanzees has been estimated to be about that of a three-year-old. So basically, anything past what three or four-year-olds can do is what you need a frontal lobe to do. See, civilization, right? Appreciation for music, tell a good joke. These are, these are all things, capacities that children don't have that it took us the development of frontal lobes to be able to do. There are a lot of formal tests of executive function that are out there that would, uh, you could refer a case to a neuropsychologist to have done, uh, but most of these aren't practical for routine screening. And what we need here is a situation where people in the field would be able to identify who has executive impairment and make the proper referral. And so the list of more or less practical tests for bedside use is relatively small. And two of these we've developed here in San Antonio, the executive interview and clocks. The exit, we're not going to talk much about today, but I think it's, it's the best executive test that I have available um, in that it's very fast and very powerful. It, take, it has 25 items. They're all drawn from the literature of frontal lobe brain damage, and a clinician can sit down with a patient and find symptoms related, known to be related to frontal lobe dysfunction. And if the patient just happens to be a diabetic or happens to be depressed or happens to be schizophrenic and there are signs of frontal lobe dysfunction, so be it. Depression, schizophrenia, old age, these are conditions that are associated with frontal lobe dysfunction. And we just got to get used to that. We have to learn that. We have to process that. Instead, uh, the most efficient way, I think, the fastest way for uh, even lay interviewers to get started on this is to use a clock drawing test. And uh, we've developed one that I'm going to show you here, and I'll pass them out. You might uh, share those. You're going to get some experience with them tomorrow, so there's no need to run away with them today. And uh, there's, there's about 25 there, which is not quite enough here. So clocks is divided into two parts. And you'll see when you get the form that there's the grading system on the front side of the page, and on the back, it's blank. But it's really important for us that this, uh, this little uh, circle be visible through the back of the page. So it has to be on a, a you turn it over on a light side of surface like these desks here. Or if you're somewhere where you don't have a light colored surface, you'd have to bring a pad of paper or something to stick it on top of. And that's just the image of this circle bleeding through the back of the page. But Every aspect of this we designed to bring out these executive impairments, and that's called an irrelevant visual cue. So you turn the page onto the back, and you ask the patient, please draw me a clock that says 145, put the hands and numbers on its face so that a child could read it. That instruction is in the text there on the front side of the page. So you read exactly those words to the patient. Once they start to draw, you can't help them anymore. If they ask you any questions at all, all you can do is repeat that instruction. And that's it. And they take their best shot. And that's called clocks one. 
Now, this is a very executive task right now because you haven't specified what kind of clock to draw, where to put it on the page. You're not giving them any help, any feedback, any suggestions, any prompting. Whatever they can come up with, that's their clock. Then you turn the page over to the front side where the uh, grading system is, and now you're going to ask the patient to copy a clock that you will draw in that circle. And so you get these two clocks. You, uh, on the left here, we have the unprompted clocks one. In the middle, we have the copied clocks two. Clocks two is not executive anymore, because now you've drawn it for him. You've shown him what to do. You've left it there for him to use as an example, and he all he has to do is draw. So that's really a control to see if he can see, if his hands move OK, if he knows how to follow commands, right? And so that's a copy. And then traditional tests like the mini mental you may be familiar with have copying problems on there, but they don't ever ask you to do anything from scratch without prompting. So the mini mental, even though it has a drawing item on there, has no items to assess executive function. And that means, you know, the mini mental scores are good if they're higher and 30 is the best you could do. Even if you had a mini mental score of 30 out of 30, that does not say that you don't have executive impairment. You could have the executive impairment of a four-year-old child and still get a 30 out of 30 on the mini mental. <coughs> so uh, basically, the mini mental and most of the dementia screening tests that are very much like the mini mental are essentially insensitive to executive function. And so you need a specific executive test to find those cases. Anyway, here is an example. Here's an example of a well elderly retiree, 82 years old, with a normal mini mental, 20 out of 30, an exit of eight. Exit scores get worse as they go higher. 15 is where we worry about you. So at eight would be good performance. That would be good performance. So she can draw a clock from scratch. She can copy a clock. Her pentagons look okay. Her mini mental is normal. Her exit is normal. Clocks one is normal. Clocks two is normal. You don't have to worry about her. Okay, here's Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is a brain disease that affects the frontal lobes, like all the dementias do, but it also affects the back parts of the brain. It's just what Alzheimer's likes to do. And so Alzheimer's always causes other cognitive impairments besides executive function, and it always causes memory loss or even in Alzheimer's disease. So the, the idea, the misunderstanding that memory is related to dementia comes from the fact that many dementia cases, it's estimated that 70% of them have Alzheimer's disease, but then that's a selection bias. If you define memory as those cognitive disorders that involve me I mean, if you define Alzheimer's as cognitive disorders that involve memory loss, then 70% of those have Alzheimer's disease. But if you define dementia as cognitive disorders sufficient to cause disability, then Alzheimer's would be a relatively rare and uncommon dementia because there are so many more people who have executive impairment but no memory loss and it's the executive impairment that disables them, not the memory loss. So anyway, this is what the rest of the world looks like. Here's what we call type two dementias. Dementias with no cortical features. And so this one happens to have subcortical vascular disease, not Alzheimer's. And so his mini mental is normal, 28 out of 30, but his exit, 22 out of 50, would be between the average for assisted living and nursing home residents. It's comparable to what a six-year-old would do and he can't draw clocks one. But he can copy. So if he can copy, there's nothing wrong with his drawing abilities. His failure on clocks one is because he can't organize a behavior unless you provide the hints, the clues, and the executive function to help him do it. And the way he fails in society is that at home, there's nobody there to tell him what to do. And so nothing gets done, even though his memory may be fine. His language may be fine. His attention to dates and things like that may be fine. But he needs a mom, right? Think about children. Children's memories are actually pretty good, but they don't clean up their rooms, right? Because they don't need to be told what to do. They need you to sit there with them and organize every step of the plan, watch them execute it, redirect them when they get off task and keep them focused on the goal. So it's not the sort of thing you can just remind them to do something and walk away from. You have to be there, and that's what moms do. That is what uh, executively impaired populations need. Now there are a lot of clock drawing tests out there. In the module they gave you, they gave you some other clock drawing test, but most of them are not very sensitive to executive function. Ours is the only one that was designed from scratch to do one thing, bring out executive function. 
And so uh, there are some differences between ours and the other ones. They don't look impressive, they're kind of subtle. But still, they were designed to bring out these executive impairments, differences in you know whether a circuit is provided or what the instruction is like or the time the, the clock is set to, and then the grading systems. But fundamentally, when you put these together and try to predict executive function, ours is the only one that makes a significant uh, prediction of your executive function with other measures. And uh, this particular analysis knocked out the other ones in order. So, uh, basically, it tells you the least executive, the second least, the third least, the fourth least, uh, down till you get to the end in yellow, and those are the ones that still predict executive function, and it's basically clocks one is what it comes down to. Now, clocks one is scored on, a, it, or both clocks are scored on a 15 point metric that goes from zero to 15, highest scores are good. And we've set the cut points for young adults. So basically, uh, on clocks one, failing is anything below 10. And on clocks two, anything failing is below 12. And so if you uh, map them like this, then, I don't know if you can see this, but if you're in the box in the left lower corner, then you would be failing both tests. And that's what Alzheimer's generally does, because it destroys executive function and drawing skills at the same time, right? But if you're in the top right box, you've passed both tests at a level pretty comparable to a young adult. So we wouldn't need to really worry about you there. And if you are in the top left box, then you fail clocks one, but you pass clocks two. And that would be something very common in a non-Alzheimer's disorder, but less common in Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's actually destroys your ability to copy, you see. So basically the red line here is the average for Alzheimer's patients in our clinic. And uh, as they get worse on clocks one, as they lose their executive function, they're simultaneously losing their copying skills in parallel, and they end up in the box at the bottom left. But the blue here are cases who have stroke-related dimensions, a different dementia type. And they have more executive impairment and less drawing uh, trouble. So uh, clock drawing can be used to even distinguish groups. You probably wouldn't have to do that. All you would have to do is just find the people with executive impairment and refer them on for more assessment. Now, uh, next I want to show you that how strongly related executive function is to functional status. And the first thing to realize is that the functional outcomes, anything we're interested in, cooking, dressing, shopping, finances, those are complex goal-directed activities. They have to be planned. They have to be initiated. You have to monitor the steps. You have to sequence them in the right order and if you can't do that, it doesn't get done, right? Think of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You may understand how to make one. You may remember the ingredients. You may point to me in your kitchen where the ingredients are. But if you put them together in the wrong order, you get a mess, right? If you put the jelly on the table, then the peanut butter, and then the bread on top, that's not a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, see? So, so basically, controlling behavior is a different skill than the steps that you know how to do. And so you have to distinguish that. And executive impairment gets you two ways. It gets you directly, so you just can't make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches anymore. But it gets you indirectly because you can't access the healthcare system to get help, right? We, we had a guy who, in clinic with vascular dementia, that we had essentially fixed his executive function uh, with medicine. But in the VA, when you re run out of your medicines, you have to call a 1-900 number and uh, input your medicine to get the refill mailed to you. And when he ran out of the medicine, he lost his executive function again. So once he lost it, he couldn't access the system. So he came back to us six weeks later and he'd been off his medicines for six weeks. Right? Even though on the medicine, his executive function was much better. So, uh, so basically, uh, the healthcare system expects too much from executively impaired people because we've created a system that we think we would do well in and therefore we say, well, anybody could do these things, but they can't because they don't have the executive function to accomplish those tasks. Uh, here's a model of the level of care people live at in a retirement community in San Antonio. Um, as a function of their executive function, the number of medicines they take, many mental scores, physical disability, age, problem behavior, and education. This is the relative contribution to their level of care explained by these different variables. If you don't measure executive function, then all the other ones look like they predict level of care. But that's because you've ignored executive function. If you put an executive measure in the model, it robs all the other variables. And what you realize is that it's mostly 
executive function that determines your level of care. It's not really your mental scores, your memory, your physical problems, your aches, your pains, your, your uh, physical handicaps. Uh, people, blind people go to college. People who, amputees go skiing, right? Those sorts of physical handicaps do not keep people out of society. It's executive impairment that undermines their ability to do what needs to be done about less severe objective physical uh, incapacities. Um, here's another way of looking at it. We, we have another retirement community and we're trying to make a very subtle distinction. Who can live in independent living versus who needs congregate high rises? And uh, these are all the functional status measures we have and all of them predict the difference between these two levels of care. So these two levels of care, even though it's a pretty subtle distinction, are distinguished by the amount of services people require, right? But if we try to use their physical functions to predict level of care, they generally can't do it. Age can do it, living alone can do it, but the number of doctor visits you've had in the six, last six months, uh, how many people have glaucoma, arthritis, hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, none of those variables distinguish these two levels of care. Just whether you live alone or not. And your cognition. Every one of the cognitive measures can distinguish these two levels of care. And if we shake all of these together, then it's only the executive ones, the exit and clocks one, that will distinguish these two levels of care. So what this means is that functional status divides people into different levels of need for services, but it isn't their physical handicaps that justify those changes, those needs. It's mostly cognition. And of the cognition, it's mostly executive function. So in a world where a lot of people have executive impairment, look how vulnerable you are to fraud and abuse. In comes the junk man that you can't get rid of. And it's subtly designed to trick someone who can't really make decisions for themselves. This is just some of the junk mail I've had that tried to look really hard like something else. This has all sorts of implications for people's higher abilities. You know, there was a lot of controversy in uh, uh, the voting in Florida in 2004, but look at this ballot here. I'll try to explain this. So, basically, Basically, what's in interesting about this particular ballot are the prominent arrows, the visual cues. People with executive impairment are very susceptible to prominent visual cues, even though they're irrelevant to their plan. So I could see how somebody might start at the top left out of habit, and they see uh, Republican. And they say, oh no, I don't want to do that, because I'm suggesting that there are some you know, little old lady living in Dade County, Florida, who uh, didn't want to vote Republican. <laughs> so you follow that arrow, and you at the top over here, you say, Pat Buchanan, you say, oh no, that can't, but I don't want that. So you follow that arrow back, and that arrow leads to one of the dots, where the dot says, put punch here. You see, it's as simple as that, just the visual cues. Um, a lot of um, automobile wrecks could probably be uh, understood as visual cues. A lot of executively impaired people are involved in head-on collisions. And in night, the head-on collision, the, the survivors say, he came right at me. Well, that's right, because at night in the dark, your headlights are the strongest visual cue in the executively impaired driver's field of vision. And so it draws them in. See, they can't not hit you. They have a hard time resisting strong, irrelevant visual cues. And that's why Clocks has that irrelevant visual cue in there to try to bring that out. And it turns out that Clocks 1 is a pretty good predictor of driving capacity. Now, I've been talking about the front lobes, but it's actually a little more complicated than that. Uh, there are frontal systems that uh, determine your executive function, and they involve the frontal lobes plus deeper parts in the brain. And the frontal lobes themselves are 30% of your brain, so it's really too big to talk about it as just the frontal lobe. It makes sense to break it down into parts. And there's a dorsolateral part, which may be very important for your rational thought processes and decision making. There's an orbitofrontal, which may be very important for your emotional thinking and emotional control. And then there's a mesiofrontal that's very important for your attention to your somatic state. You know, you're, whether you're hungry, you're thirsty. So there are different kinds of plans that have to be made, and they involve different kinds of data sets. And the brain is wired in a way that different regions of the frontal lobe take charge of different kinds of information planning. So if you're worried about what you're going to do to satisfy your hunger, then it's a mesiofrontal responsibility. 
If you want to know how to negotiate for a raise with your boss, that's emotional control. If you want to know how to, uh, uh, you know, decide to, I don't know, do, do some other plan with, you know, how, what steps to clean the house in the right order, then that's going to be dorsolateral. So different brain diseases mess up different aspects of decision making. It's not an all or none thing. And these circuits are all built alike where a part of the cortex will talk to these deeper parts of the brain that then give their feedback back to the frontal lobes. And these parts of the brain, the striatum and the pallidum and the thalamus are uh, thought of as the basic ganglia and subcortical nuclei. And these circuits are vulnerable to every demanding disease known to man affects this circuit somewhere. So for example, a, a rare kind of disease called Wilson's disease affects the globus pallidum. So do little, little bitty infarcts. And Huntington's disease and other infarcts will hit the caudate or the striatum. And then the Alzheimer's, PICS, frontal lobe dementia, Lewy body disease, the commonly talked about dementias, they hit the cortex. All of them, though, have executive impairment, regardless of whether or not they affect the circuit at the level of the cortex. So you can be just as executively impaired from a subcortical lacoon, a little bitty stroke that you got after your cabbage heart procedure, uh, as you would from Alzheimer's disease. But in the case of the subcortical lacoon, your memory will be normal. Your mini mental will be normal. Nobody will realize what happened to you. You'll just be discharged home with no special instructions because your mini mental is normal. But now you have the executive function of a 10-year-old child. And if we go visit your house in a month, you've gone off all your medicines. You haven't renewed them. You're living in filth. You're not feeding yourself. You're not executing plans anymore. And when we give you the mini mental, you'll still look normal. And we'll scratch your head. What, what's that about? Maybe he's depressed. You see? And so basically, that's, that's how it works. Now I want to show you in the last few minutes here that this isn't necessarily a permanent state. We're used to thinking of dementia as permanent. We also think of dementia as progressive. Both of those are prejudices built by our experience with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's pathology is inexorable and moves you know, over different brain regions over time and gets worse. But that doesn't mean dementia is, because most dementia isn't really going to be Alzheimer's, especially if you loosen up your de definition so that memory isn't so important. So um, here, for example, is an alcoholic who came in. This is his clocks on admission. His exit is 33. That would be the average for dementia-specific care units buried in a nursing home. You know, the Alzheimer's unit, the wandering unit, would have an average exit of about 33. His mini mental is 20, which is uh, a moderately bad mini mental, according to Alzheimer's researchers. And he can't draw a clock from scratch, right? But here's the same guy three days later. So your executive function can change. You can come in with terrible executive functions, but if we find the right cause and fix it, then sometimes it'll just come right back, OK? And here's another thing, the relationship between exit scores, which we didn't talk much about, but remember, everybody over 15 is bad. So everybody on the right of that red line, the vertical red line of 15, has failed. Everybody above 24 in the mini mental has passed. Look how many people, this is just people coming to our medical clinics. Look what a large <coughs> fraction, it's about 30% of consecutively evaluated medical outpatients will fail the exit but still have a normal mini mental. Since their mini mental is normal, they're not likely to be identified by any dementia screening uh, strategy that involves a memory measure. These are the ones you never assess, so you never prevent, so you never treat, and they never get better. And they're the ones that you know, live in filth at home, and you scratch your head at how they could get there. Uh, here's another way of looking at it. Exit scores get high as they get bad. Children don't have good executive function. So on the far left are children between the ages of 6 and 11. And then there are young adults who average about 5 on the exit. Mm -hmm. And then two triangle groups in, uh, blue, in blue are type 2 diabetics, non-insulin dependent diabetics in medicine clinics at our VA here. And the red are elderly, well elderly controls in a retirement community who are not thought of as demented. But both of those groups are operating at the level of the children. And the diabetics, whose average age is very young, you know, 50, 60 year old diabetics, with normal mini mentals, they're operating with the executive function of 80-year-olds, right? So this is a very common problem that pervades all of healthcare delivery 
uh, because we've ignored it and we've been yeah. testing the wrong kinds of cognitive function, the memory instead. But memory doesn't predict functional status independently of the executive function. Here's another way to look at it. Here are some more uh, young adults scoring below five on the exit on the far left. And then at the far right are Alzheimer's patients in nursing home units, people that the mini-mental would detect as having a problem. But the other two groups are people who would pass the mini-mental. On the left are young adults with schizophrenia. And on the right are well elderly controls. The well elderly are already losing their executive function. They're not as bad as Alzheimer's, but they're much worse than young adults. And they're comparable to young adults who have what we would call brain diseases, right? But these people are not thought of as having a brain disease. They're merely old. But it turns out that executive function is vulnerable to changes in different neurotransmitters, and some of those neurotransmitters decline linearly with age, starting at age 40. And as you get older and older and older, you're losing your executive function. And we've shown that the slope of change in executive function explains almost half the variance in the slope of change in functional status in well elderly uh, living in retirement communities followed you know, longitudinally over time. So, so basically, it's not their deteriorating vision or hearing or arthritis that's predicting their need for new services over time. It's the fact that their de cognition is declining and uh, we haven't been measuring them. Uh, we're just starting to worry about how we could uh, reliably fix this and who to uh, treat. And so I just wanted to share a few anecdotal responses here from our clinic. Uh, here, here's a guy with uh, vascular depression. Uh, you know, in old age, depression isn't caused by the same things that are associated with depression when you're young. In the elderly, it's very likely that you have subcortical vascular infarcts. The subcortical vascular disease becomes a major determinant of late onset major depression. And uh, what's interesting about that is that those infarcts are in the frontal circuits. So the elderly with depression are much more likely to have executive impairment than a young person with the same level of sadness. See, because the brain disease is really different. So here's a guy who comes in with a normal mini mental, 27 out of 30, but his exit is the average, like I said, for assisted living to nursing home, right in that range, uh, or a six-year-old child, and he can't draw a clock from scratch. And we start to treat him here with an, what's an antidepressant. Right? It happens to be Zoloft or Sertraline. And uh, a week later, too early really to be making uh, improvement in his mood, uh, his executive function is better. His exit dropped to the average for assisted living. And then a week after that, it's in the range of independent dwelling adults. His clock has come back. But his mini mental didn't change. So if you had been using the mini mental, first of all, you would not recognize he had cognitive impairment. And if he got better, you wouldn't recognize that the reason he got better was because cognition improved. And so you wouldn't understand that this particular antidepressant was making his executive function better. And we noticed this, so we're treating people with this medicine uh, when they don't have depression. We're treating people with isolated executive impairment, type two dementia, subcortical vascular disease. And so here are some of these cases. Here's an 80-year-old with vascular disease, and he's not depressed. He has an exit that is the average for nursing home residents. His mini mental is 29 out of 30. He can't draw a clock. And three months later, his clock is normal, his exit's normal, his mini mental is normal. And here's another one, another 80 year old. And remember, it's the 80 year olds are the fastest growing age group in the country. They're the ones developing these disexecutive syndromes. So he can't draw a clock. Again, his mini mental is normal, 25 out of 30 is still considered normal. His exit, though, is close to the average for dementia-specific care units in a retirement community. And uh, his exit and mini mental both improve with treatment, and so does his clocks. Here's the third one, the younger one. Mini mental 19, that's uh, abnormal, so that's pretty bad. Exit 18, that's the average for assisted living. Clocks is a little screwed up. Uh, we treat him, his mini mental doesn't really change much, but his exit drops four points and is now normal. Uh, four points is probably a meaningful change on the exit. Uh, you know that uh, one of the Alzheimer's drugs, galantamine, has been used in a trial of vascular dementia, and the exit was used as an outcome in that study, and galantamine, the quote, dementia drug, made the exits on average one point better in a sample of 500 per group. He got four points better here. So we're, we're doing much better with antidepressants to treat non-Alzheimer's dementias. 
Here's another one, mini mental 28, exit 26, average for uh, nursing home care. He drops to normal to a mini, an exit of 13. And uh, I've been talking about type two dementia because we had to make a word up for it because it isn't in the book. There is no, there's only one kind of dementia in the book. That's the dementia that looks like Alzheimer's, what we call type one. But what I want to show you here is that these two syndromes are different with regard to the ratio of the score of the mini mental and the exit. So on the bottom line, that's what the average Alzheimer's patient does. As they get worse in the exit, their mini mental scores get worse. But on the top is the average uh, non-Alzheimer's with a type two dementia. Their mini mental gets worse, but at a much slower rate compared to the exit. And most of them still have normal mini mentals, okay? So if you use the mini mental or a similar widely accepted evidence-based screen for dementia, you'll be detecting type one cases and you'll miss all of the type twos. But if you wanna find who gets better, it's the type twos who have the better treatment responses. The type ones have much uh, weaker responses. So you'll be screening people, you'll find some, most will have Alzheimer's and few of them will ever respond to your interventions. And the ones who most could have benefited are the ones that you'll say are normal and not intervene on. You see? So the definition of dementia has to be broadened to encompass these uh, presentations with isolated executive impairment because uh, then you'll be finding a group of people that are equally disabled, equally executively impaired, but who can't otherwise be detected well. And uh, you'll be intervening on more of them and have uh, good outcomes. So in summary, executive impairment is very common in healthcare delivery. It's also disabling. The mini mental and its similar tests are insensitive to this cognitive domain. Clocks is one relatively easy, brief, uh, reliable bedside way to do this. Uh, you have to realize that not everybody with executive impairment has a quote, mental disorder. A whole lot of people with medical disorders are developing executive impairment and some of it is caused by the treatments for their, for their medical disorder. So we may be in a position one day of having to choose between, would you rather, you know, uh, reduce your risk of a heart attack or a stroke by taking such and such medicine, or uh, trade, I'll trade you that risk in the future for dementia today, right? But that happens, that's exactly what we're doing to a lot of people by rigorously trying to achieve the recommended guidelines because the guidelines were never developed to avoid executive function. Most of the guidelines are totally indifferent to that. They never imagined that these medicines could make executive function worse. All they're looking at is the stroke or the heart attack at the end of the road. But what they may be missing is that they're iatrogenically inducing dementia in people. It's just not the dementia that we've been looking for. So. Here are your post-test questions. You have them in your handouts there, and I bet you you can find the answer to them all now. Thanks a lot.